I'm in the city, I'm in San Francisco. Well, coming in, but why don't we just get started since we have some mess here. Um, so, well, first off, thank you everyone for taking the time today. And today we have Jason Prudo, um, who is a product engineer at Facebook to talk about how to survive the tech rush. Um, a little bit of background about Jason. Um, other than his tech bro since 2016, he has been ex interested in um, this question and exploring um, from different angles. For example, he helped union organizing campaigns on tech campuses, organized employee activism, inside tech company, top, top tech companies, and also studied alternative ways to venture back platforms. Um, and Today, we also have Aiden, who graciously agreed to moderate this site, uh, fireside chat. Um, so maybe, uh, Jason, I'll just pass it on to you uh, to talk for a few minutes about your experience organizing within the tech industry, and then we open up for questions. Uh, thanks so much, and thanks for having me, y'all. It's nice to see folks today. Um, I'll just talk kind of briefly about myself a bit, because uh, I'd love to get to, to questions and start this conversation. Um, so hi, uh, I'm Jason. I was until recently a software engineer at Facebook. Actually, I left earlier this year. Um, I've been a full-time software engineer at like FANG level companies for about 12 years, uh, working largely on platforms. So communication platforms, application platforms, kind of thinking about like the platform wars every day. Um, uh, when I left Facebook earlier this year, I was working on the Libra cryptocurrency project. So I spent about a year and a half on that before leaving. Um, when I left, I went to DC for several weeks to work on the Bernie Sanders campaign, uh, doing data engineering pipelines there. Um, as that wrapped up, um, shelter in place started. So right now I'm taking time off and figuring out what to do next um, in, with my life uh, and like what role the tech industry will play in that. Um, I think I've gone from being like the most avid tech booster and believer in like the positive uh, like potentials of the tech industry in Silicon Valley to being what I think people would probably call a tech critic. Um, I don't exactly uh, call myself that, but you wouldn't be wrong to, to label me that, I guess. Um, so I'm uh, writing about tech, uh, thinking deeply about the way the tech industry works today and how I want it to change um, and looking to leverage it, some of the experiences I've had uh, organizing within the tech industry to uh, build worker power. That's something we say a lot um, because we think uh, the tech industry right now is very dominated by these uh, centralized sources of power, venture capitalists, um, a few like celebrity executives um, who probably, you know, think they're doing good for the world or that's one of their goals, but they're structurally beholden to their shareholders. They're structurally beholden to the interests of capital, uh, which just necessarily at times contradict the interests of workers and the inter interests of users. Um, so uh, kind of how I got my start in thinking about these questions um, is, yeah, in 2016, I kind of woke up the day after that election and was like, oh, I guess some of, the, some of my assumptions were wrong, probably. I think I need to maybe question some of these and maybe change the direction I was on. Uh, so one of the uh, ways I put that into, into practice is uh, I got involved with a labor union, activist, a labor, labor union organization uh, at Facebook campus and as well as other campuses. Uh, so in 2016, 2017, uh, there was an issue just on Facebook campus where um, you know, there are about 600 cafeteria workers who serve food on campus every day. Uh, they largely grew up in Menlo Park, very close to the Facebook office, uh, and suddenly they're finding that they can no longer afford to live there. They're being priced out and being, being sent to places like Vallejo and Tracy. Um, so I got to know a lot of these workers as well as a lot of union organizers at uh, Unite Here, which is a local uh, union um, that has, uh, an international union even, that has um, a lot of like hospitality workers in it, like the Marriott strikes you might have seen in San Francisco is the Unite Here union. Uh, so I met with those workers and um, over the course of about a year uh, worked with that campaign from uh, the time it was underground. So I'd like meet with workers in secret go to their houses with other workers and tell them like, you know, uh, we think as a software engineer, I think you deserve better than you're getting. Uh, and one way to, to advocate for yourself would be to join this union with other workers. Um, so I worked with them playing just a very small part uh, of, of their campaign uh, to uh, spread advocacy among other workers and then um, build kind of a campaign of support inside the company. Uh, so something you might see at uh, 
at, at like other tech companies or other large uh, companies where a union fight is happening, this kind of like class divide between a high wage worker and low wage worker would be, you know, the, the low wage workers feel that the high wage workers don't care about them. They don't make eye contact with them. Their boss might say, you know, if you go on strike, they're going to hate you, stuff like that. Um, my job was to build a campaign internally inside Facebook that made it very clear that uh, if it came down to a bunch of service workers walking off the job in the form of a strike, um, all the full-time employees were going to be furious at our management and not at these low-wage workers. Um, so to do that, I built, um, started to build out a kind of internal advocacy group. You know how inside your company you might have like a Slack channel about like board games or something. Um, so we built something like that at Facebook called Workers of Facebook. Uh, the goal and um, this is a group where people would talk about workers' issues and. Uh, uh, kind of like give updates on these various union campaigns happening on campus after uh, cafeteria workers won their union, security officers did the same, even bike transit workers, um, shuttle drivers, now most service workers on most big campuses are unionized as a part of this campaign. Uh, so that group rooted like three or 400 people over the course of the cafeteria worker campaign. Uh, when I left earlier this year, it was at 2,600 people and was kind of a hub for activism around issues, uh, especially labor issues, uh, kind of bread and butter, like my job is not safe issues or like I'm not getting paid enough issues. Um, so it was kind of my path to being critical of tech. Uh, you know, if uh, this huge multinational corporation, Facebook, uh, can't even take care of its own workers, people who work on campus every day, and then can't even take care of its own community, like the two miles around Menlo Park, uh, how can we possibly trust them to be um, good stewards of, of like the, the world discourse? Uh, so that led me to questioning things a little bit more, um, and uh, we can get more into that conversation, uh, but maybe now I've, I would consider myself kind of a, a skeptic of, of uh, multinational social media. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there, and I'd love to hear some questions. Well, great to talk, great to hear from you, great to talk to you. I, uh, we, we're really happy to have you. Um, I didn't know who you were. Similarly, I never heard of you before I was asked to interview you. So it was fascinating, again, just reach, reaching in and reading about somebody that you never knew existed. But I, I, was, I appreciated what I, what, what I, I was reading and, and um, I, I, a bunch of questions sort of bubbled up from the people in the community. Um, but uh, the first question was phrased, why is everyone mad about tech? I, my question is like, why, why is there anger about, about tech? Um, yeah, great. And um, yeah, thanks for having me because I'm just some guy. I'm not like a big deal venture capitalist. I can't help y'all's career. I'm just here to talk, you know? Um, and I'm, I'm glad that people want to have these kind of conversations. Um, so people have come to call this era the tech lash, like the tech backlash. Um, it's not a term I throw around a lot, but people do use that term. Uh, I would say that it's defined by this shift in sentiment from a, a default of trusting and feeling positive towards tech companies and tech celebrities to kind of a, just a default pose of skepticism. Uh, I do want to point out that this is not actually uh, a skepticism of technology itself. Like we're all linked more than ever through technology and I think people love like technology very much in their lives today. Um, like we're not suddenly questioning like, was the transistor a good idea or something? Uh, I think it's more like we are skeptical of uh, the corporations, the structures and the people in charge of technology. Like why do certain actors get to steer the development of technology and its application and what interests are they serving? Uh, so people, you know, are super mad at say, um, Facebook for, for allowing misinformation on its platform. Uh, there's a lot of media narrative about that. I think a lot of it is overblown, but there's also something kind of like fundamentally, uh, there's some fundamental reason for this distrust there, right? People are starting to wake up to understand that um, <clears throat> this, this like product that we rely on, that we like give so much power to, to since we rely on it to connect us to our loved ones, uh, isn't actually in acting in our interests all the time, right? They have um, metrics that they have to, to serve instead of, uh, you know, value or user uh, value to the user or the way they even want to measure value to the user is inherently maybe skewed towards um, things that are they're more profitable. Like, you know, there's a lot of backlash against time spent as the core metric today. And, and that's like the uh, been a driving metric at these large companies for a long time. Like how many hours a day is a user putting their eyeballs to our surfaces? Um, 
the kind of user friendly story for that for a long time has been, well, you know, the more people use something that it, the more value they must be getting out of it. Right. And that's been kind of the justification mm -hmm. internally in these big platform companies. Um, I think we should be skeptical of that for kind of two reasons. One is, you know, imagine if like broadcast television had that metric. Do we really believe that somebody who watches six hours of TV a day would be well served by adding a marginal seventh hour a day? I don't think we really believe that. And I think, you know, maybe when, when a tech company product was going from five minutes a day to seven minutes a day, that captured some notion of value. When it's going from like two hours a day to two and a half hours a day, that starts to feel like they're running up the score on our like dopamine receptors. Um, or more, or way more than two and a half hours, yeah. For the uh, youth, certainly, yeah. Um, and then the second reason is like, well, you know, time spent is really a, a proxy for ad revenue. And it's like, right. you know, you can say you're giving me value, but if it's also lining your pockets, like, you know, who am I going to believe? You know, it's like, uh, what comes to my mind is a, a, a scene from a film about a little village where it's totally no technology. It's like they have a you know, a, a turbine turning wa water to a wheel turning water to generate in, in, in the in the little village and that's it. And, and I was I, I, I guess the immediate I jumped to the extreme there. And I think, uh, is there a, a is there a dream of a world anymore that, that has no technology in it that has no I mean, this seems like a totally absurd question. But I mean, I, I, I hear the word tech lash and mm -hmm. i think that it actually does contain that as well it does contain like a, a fundamental anxiety about about technology and whether it's actually connecting us deeper i have read you've written a lot about this because you've written about how uh how you feel you can we can encounter each other authentically but at the same time if we're being manipulated in, in this by this entire system i guess i'm still trying to wrap my head around it all to tell you the truth not to not to just think out loud, but uh, um. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I think there's there's a lot there actually. Um, so I like I hope hopefully you've been saying enough. I love technology. I'm not like a luddite. Um, or I'm not like fundamentally scared of these devices. Um, on the other hand, or like in contrast, I, I feel very connected to technology and through technology. Um, growing up as a kind of shy like com computer using nerdy youth. Uh, my family moved around a lot. Most of my first like close personal connections as a person were, were actually formed online with like internet friends. Um, and uh, so I've always believed in the potential of, of technology to connect us. Uh, and then I would even take it further and, and say that uh, this like primitivist ideal of, uh, of like a human life without technology is actually contradictory and doesn't doesn't really represent something that ever happened or it's, it's a historical um uh donna haraway makes this case a lot she's a, a feminist philosopher uh who wrote a seminal work called uh, a cyborg manifesto <clears throat> uh, in it i think she says a lot it's very dense but one one thing i took away from it is that uh technology has just always been a part of our definition of ourselves um it would be like the same way that it would be kind of farcical to imagine a human outside of society. It's, it's, it doesn't make sense to imagine a human right. separate from technology. Um, so maybe my problem with the term tech lash is that we're mad at computers and I'm not mad at computers. I'm mad at uh, rich people who, who uh, oh, I guess I call them oligarchs who, you know, control what computers are made and how and what for. Talking about hu human lash then, not tech, not tech lash. Um, yeah, you can only ever be mad at people. I mean, I guess I, I'm a programmer, so I get mad at the computer a lot, but it's different. Yeah, it's different. Well, speaking of that, actually, we, one of the, thing, the correspondences that we exchanged, we were talking about uh, GTP3. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the um, anyway, I know that we're bouncing too much. I'm sorry. Okay. I know, I, 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 I'm sorry if you, would, if you would just humor me here. Uh, the, 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 have you familiar with this? Can you break down for, 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 people what what this is you do, were you familiar with this um yeah i've seen a, a lot of discussion about gpt3 at the moment it seems to be just the most um advanced deep learning uh generative ai system so far it's like you know a few years ago we talked about style transfer like show this ai a painting and now make make a painting out of a photo like it uh it seems to be that but it's quite general it can write i've seen examples of it writing short programs uh writing 
fairly passable prose or poetry. Um, so it's a very general uh, generative AI system. Well, I, I guess I, uh, anyway, I guess I evoked that to, to just acknowledge what you're saying, that there's so much beauty in, 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 the, in the, the tech world as well. And that's, that's where your, our relationships and insights are formed. But I, I guess I'm still trying to build out the, the criticism of, of, mm -hmm. of, um, of, of what you're saying. I guess, why did you leave Facebook this year? I mean, aside from shelter in place, it seems like a good time to go within mm -hmm. and to, if, you, if you have the means to. Uh, uh, so I, I, but I wonder, why did you leave? Mm. Um, yeah, if you have critical feelings about tech, I would urge you not to quit. Um, I would urge you to, to um, use the unique skills and, and position you might have as a technologist to affect change from inside and from outside. Um, I think the kind of the proximate cause was I kind of threw up my hands at uh, a particular issue that I found Facebook to be acting pretty unethical in. Um, we've referred to it as paid civic misinformation, you know, like ads not being fact-checked if they're made by political actors. Um, I think previous to that, I had always kind of at least thought Facebook was acting in good faith um, when it would strive to be, say, a neutral platform, you know, like these algorithms are in some sense neutral. Um, at the point when Facebook starts making a lot of money off of misinformation and, you know, having ad sales teams deployed with political campaigns, like, you know, tens of people working with a political campaign that is spreading misinformation, I thought that was a little bit of a bridge too far. Um, but the, the deeper cause was definitely like burnout. Um, I felt since 2016, I'd been kind of working two jobs, you know, working on my, my day job as a software engineer and then my um, like second job is somebody trying to affect change um, uh, with these labor campaigns or, or some other kind of impact based campaigns. And uh, I think it was, it was too much for too long and I ended up just being so burned out. I wasn't really making forward progress on either of them. So it uh, felt like the right time to, to get out. Um, but I, uh, I think these tech platforms, I think of them as very similar to the state or to the government. Uh, I can't just decide like, I don't like the government, so I'm not gonna participate. That, that doesn't really make sense. So uh, I can't, you can't just um, pretend Google isn't there. Uh, and if you have thoughts about the way you want Google or Facebook to change, like working there is a decent way to, to affect that. Sure, I, I think um, it's interesting because uh, one of the distinctions you also made in a note you wrote to me was between uh, you were, it, evoking I w and I didn't know this writer Donna what, what's her, what's her Donna name? Haraway Haraway uh, and and Simone Vey and uh, you I, I, I you you brought forth the word uprootedness I guess I'm I'm, I'm asking you <laughs> not to harp on it but I guess you must have felt uprooted entirely when when you uh, when you left Facebook recently you felt you didn't identify with your environment anymore and that's no doubt related to what you what your crit what your critique is of, 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 uh, of, of, of that organization as well. Um, I, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about atomization. You talked about atomization in that, in that it's to skip back. I'm sorry, I'm, I know I'm skipping around uh, sure. totally, but if you could speak to that idea. Um. Yeah, so um, there's ways in which uh, technology builds community. And I think, you know, uh, at its best, tools like Facebook are tools for building community. And there's a lot of emphasis put in that. Um, at the same time, there you have to kind of ask, why is it that we want are now building community through like a mediated device through our phones while we're sitting at home? Um, Right now we're in quarantine, of course, but generally like we, we've been on this trend for a long time. Uh, so there's something happening in society where <clears throat> um, in-person civic participation uh, and kind of a in-person in community structures are on the decline. Uh, we've lost some of those essential structures, whether they're churches or, um, you know, the small town. Uh, these things just didn't make the jump to the late 20th century. Um, and from the world of political economy, uh, I think this is often described of as probably the process of neoliberalization. 
Um, so neoliberalism is a term that gets thrown around a lot. Uh, I guess you could describe it as kind of a, a new form of capitalism under which um, labor has less power. So like you might've been a member of a union, like one out of three people or so were uh, about 50 years ago. Now it's more like one out of 10. Uh, you might've had other kind of structures in your life that, that lent you support of a community. Um, but now like you're, oh, you also might've had like a more multi-generational family, like your relationship to your community, your relationship to society was more uh, a part of like group identities. Um, today, uh, with, after this process of atomization, your relationship to society is more likely to be individualized. Uh, so your relationship to your uh, workplace, uh, you know, you don't have a union to support you probably. Uh, you now, right now are probably working from home, which is a whole another level of optimization. But then, you know, some, you know, tens of millions of people in America work for a platform company where their job is, their boss is an app, right? They don't ever see their coworkers. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have really belong to a community of workers um, beyond maybe like a company sponsored, excuse me, a company sponsored Facebook group about their job. Uh, so now, uh, everyone is acting, interacting with these large systems as an individual more so than a group. And this disempowers people in a variety of ways. Um, you know, in the labor aspect, you just don't have access to collective bargaining, which um, you start to, as a result, you start to see, you know, productivity continue to increase over time, but like wages stay flat. Um, so as these two numbers have kind of like diverged, we start to see, um, you know, inequality grow. Uh, this is, seems to be, perfectly compatible with the continued growth of capital, um, but doesn't seem to be compatible with the continued flourishing of, of like human life, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. That's more of a value judgment, but I think uh, strong and cohesive communities probably lead to richer and fuller lives than uh, this more atomized experience. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, I, uh, I'm reminded by all the, um, but, well, you were talking, I'm sorry, you're just, you're, you're making me think about too many things at once, I'm afraid. I, I, the, 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 the Donna Haraway manifesto, the a cyborg manifesto, and, and, and how power and control operates, which you said earlier about not, uh, not being able to imagine human life separate from, from these, uh, these techno from technology, from these, from all technology. Uh, and and then now we have to reckon with power and control. We can't we can't we can't uh, we can't exclude human humanity from technology. So we have to mm -hmm. really fundamentally challenge the way that technology has totally proliferated proliferated in such a short span of time. Is mm -hmm. you know uh, um, uh, I I would like to ask you some of the more questions that were posed here. Um, sure. Let's see, we had sort of a specific, specific question. Can you elaborate on how TikTok is the same as Facebook and Google in, in, in terms of this criticism? Um, yeah, um, to go back to Haraway for a second, I think a, a quick summary of the Cyborg Manifesto might just be that um, uh, we were fucked from the start. Like there is no pristine state to return to. Uh, that's like kind of a Western myth. Uh, and instead we're, we're doomed to grapple with this relationship of technology and humanity forever. Um, so that, that, you know, makes, actually makes me hopeful as, as dire as it sounds. Um, on to, yeah, kind of this question of TikTok versus Facebook and Google. Um, this might be in reference to something I recently wrote um, just for my newsletter, which is I would be surprised if people saw it because it's small, but thanks for reading if you did. I, I haven't seen it. Uh, this was the question that I think Abby posed. Ah, uh, cool. Um, so uh, I would definitely not say they're the same. I think my argument was that it's an alien versus predator situation where whoever wins, we lose. Um, I, let's see. So uh, I was writing in response to this argument that Ben Thompson uh, put forth in his newsletter, Stratechery. Uh, so he kind of broke TikTok, the problems with TikTok down into to two buckets, and this, these are why uh, there's currently, he says there's currently a backlash against TikTok's growth in, in the West. Um, the first is that it, it siphons just tons of data out of your device, and it goes, that data goes into a database that, in theory, the Chinese Communist Party could access. Um, his second problem is that TikTok utilizes this algorithmically ranked feed 
um, even more so than you know Facebook or Twitter. It's it is only an algorithmically ranked feed, really. Um, and that feed, since it is opaque, could be used to censor uh, mm -hmm. certain viewpoints or inject propaganda. Uh, he says that the second issue of the, the ranked feed is, is the bigger problem. And I agree with him there. I actually agree with the latter's argument. I just think it's uh, kind of, uh, it needs to be expanded. Um, so Thompson presented this nightmare scenario where the Chinese state um, uses its control over TikTok to uh, influence American elections and then maybe blackmail politicians saying, you know, you owe your career to, to China. Uh, it'd be, you know, terrible if this, you know, bad story got highlighted about you and suddenly you have American leaders and political leaders uh, beholden to Chinese interests. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, you know, he has this, he kind of poses this like war of ideas, this very idealistic um, argument that, you know, the West represents, at its best, represents these liberal values of inclusion and free speech, and uh, China does not. It, it uh, pushes these values of conformity um, and harmony, maybe. Um, so uh, I reject that part of his argument. Uh, I would say that the conflict between the West and China is not about ideals. It's not about communism versus capitalism. I think that's a very convenient framing. I think what it's actually about is just very material things, right? Like the, the United States has military bases in over 150 countries. We have like, uh, you know, 70 aircraft carriers out there. We could, you know, uh, we have, we're the military hegemon of the planet. Um, you kind of have to fall into like Western, the, the order proposed by the Western consensus if you want to like play nice on the world stage. And that doesn't always work out nicely for people. Like um, if you, end up like uh, having too many social democratic policies in your country, you might find global resistance to it in the form of uh, support for local coups or something in the very, very extreme case. Uh, so I, I kind of reject his idealistic argument there in favor of a more materialist argument. Uh, and then uh, what he actually takes issue with like very much on the ground, like, you know, this ranked feed is dangerous. Why would we trust a Chinese company with this? I'm like, yeah, I totally agree. Uh, why do we trust Facebook with that power? I, I don't think they've wielded it super responsibly. Um, you know, if you uh, have this ranked feed that can be manipulated either by literally just buying ads or by, um, you know, participating in this arms race between uh, can you pay more for uh, saboteurs to uh, manufacture content for it and manipulate the algorithm from outside versus the kind of AI defense team inside, like, it's, that still means that the most powerful uh, interests with the most money to throw at these problems get to, you know, control what media like a billion or two billion people consume. Um, I don't really think I don't feel comfortable with that at all, even if there's a market involved. Hmm. Well, I, I guess it comes back to that ethical evolution that I, I've been that was invoked in the last fireside chat. That with Reed Hoffman was a sense of now we have to kind of uh, advance and and really rev revise, rebuild our 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 civil society so that we can. If I mean, if if we can, yeah, as you 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 invoked uh, you you invoke politics uh, a demo a democratic um, democratic socialist mm -hmm. um, and the, I, I, what I appreciate is how I see how you. You, you like to act, you want to act on this. And what, I guess I'm wondering what I can do, what, what, uh, what, uh, what, what, what people can do to, um, to help, help your, your, your cause, I suppose, um, to help that cause. Uh, that... Uh, yeah, I think um, like kind of holding tech accountable would be the big goal. Um... So this is hard. I have a lot of arguments against doing certain things, I guess, a lot of um, like problems with how I see uh, solutions offered today. Um, it, com it comes down to uh, kind of, is, do you view this as a, as a, do you view like say misinformation uh, as a problem of like individual consumers or do you view it as a problem of systemic forces mm -hmm. at the point of production? Um, if it's the former, then like, you know, educate yourself, read fact checks, um, kind of uh, spread, you know, spread the truth whenever you can, call out falsehood. Um, those are kind of, uh, I guess, uh, 
uh, California ideological uh, positions where you change yourself and through doing so you change the world. Um, I think there's a place for that. And I think that's uh, important on like many scales and many communities. Uh, I don't think that's exactly the right tool for, the, for what we're seeing. Um, like there are, <clears throat> uh, even just within say our sentiment on tech, um, these companies, these large companies measure, measure like sentiment metrics pretty obsessively. Um, so at Facebook, you know, it'd be cares about users. Uh, this has been published a bit, like they have this cow metric CAU. Uh, so every change at Facebook kind of adjusts how much people trust Facebook. Uh, and now Facebook will measure any experiment against cow and see, you know, Hey, like this drove revenue or time spent in this way. And it, it tweak this metric, but it, it sacrificed like this many points of, of sentiment, um, should we launch it? And um, in a way that's, you know, an improvement on just not caring about the user, but it's also a little scary that they have so much uh, insight and control uh, that we don't, right? We don't, we don't have access to that, to that data as, as its users. Uh, so I think, um, you know, if you're looking at an individual response, like, you shouldn't feel like you're able to, you shouldn't feel bad if you're not able to do that. Like if you eat the junk food, if you, if you scroll Instagram, like what hope did you ever have? There's people paid like seven figure salaries to make you do this. Uh, and they, they run, they, they own the infrastructure. They, they, they pay the politicians, like, you know, the deck was stacked against us as users. Um, so, uh, as a, you know, you added me as a socialist, I suppose, uh, as a socialist, I, I believe like our power always comes through organization. It always comes through mass participation. Uh, like we can't really do anything on our own, but as a, as a group, we can do a lot. Um, I think we can get into kind of the reforms that I, I support the most. And I've written about this a bit. Um, I, I want reforms to always be like non-reformist. Uh, I want them to, to tackle kind of systemic issues. Uh, yeah, on the, on the left, we, we refer to these, uh, like reformism is a, is a bad word on the left. That means like you're not really trying to solve like the real problem. You're just trying to do these piecemeal reforms. Uh, but then instead you have these non-reformist reforms that, are, that get at the core issues. Um, the biggest ones would always be uh, for me around transparency. I think empowering people to make decisions is, is a good is this good step that everyone can usually agree on? Um, and then, you know, to get to the TikTok example, but I think it kind of cuts across misinformation and everything. It is pretty unbelievable to me that, uh, that the ranking algorithms are hidden from us. Like, what are, what are they trying to hide from us? Why, why are the learning systems that rank newsfeed um, so secretive? And, you know, in a sense, like, GPT-3 might be published open source. Um, a lot of these like core algorithms are like actually kind of just established mathematic mathematics. They're they're freely available, but that's not the interesting part of these learning systems. What's interesting is you know the data pipelines that come in and out, the features they rank on, um, the like kind of and then the ends they're pointed at. So um, I've written about one proposal I have where uh, we you look at platforms and kind of taxonomize them. Uh, in pretty specific ways about what they do and how much power they hold. Um, you know, where a startup, like, I think startups are pretty, are stuck dealing with like GDPR, for instance. That seems like a big mistake. Like a, a startup that has a million users doesn't really need to, like at a systemic level, care that much about privacy, data, uh, data takeout. You know, I think like uh, up to a few million users, like a technology product or a network should have to, um, like like meet regulations around kind of basic deletion of data for wipeout, opt in about collection of some data, but like largely it should be, you know, the wild west of it because these aren't like a, a linchpin of our society. When you start to get up to more having tens of millions of users, like then I'm, I start to question like, what are you doing with this, uh, with these secret algorithms? What, like maybe you should be publishing reports around the data they collect, the data they use and, and how. Um, there should be like maybe a technical diagram at the level of uh, mm. systems and services that that I, any user, any uh, inspector should be able to like look at and understand like, oh, I see that, you know, the outcome of this decision could actually be affected by this, this user action very far away. You know, are we comfortable with that? Um, once you get to more like the 100 million user, like the, the size of TikTok in the West or, or Instagram many years ago, um, you're starting to become like, the, the, the power company, the um, like a, a utility. And we aren't really comfortable with, uh, you know, 
uh, undemocratic control or totally opaque for-profit control of essential services, right? And at some point you start needing like, I, I don't see an argument against just like open sourcing most of the internal systems of, of these uh, ranking systems. Well, it, it's, it, it ultimately comes back to how, how you, how you, how we want to make this, this integration towards, I mean, that I, to bring the word, the singularity, it's like, as I look, 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 look forward, it's like, it seems inevitable that, mm. Uh, that uh, te technology and government and um, the the individual life and community lives are going to be totally transformed, um, and 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 how do we uh, demand that um, we talk about this conversation? How do we how do we how do we shift the conversation? You know, I mean, um, where we, you're saying this this algorithm should be. Uh, should be available to the people. It reminds me almost like a, um, it's funny we talked about reform, a ref, reform not being a good word. It almost seems like a commensurate to the reformation though. With this idea of like, we have these big, essentially power vestments where it's like this arcane uh, 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 data on all these algorithms are withheld from the people. Mm. And and there's a, a, a demand to say, no, we, we need to, we need to open the doors and windows, as it were, and 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 see how these things work, so that we can all participate in this together. And we can, I mean, it, it's a, it's a, it's a. I, I appreciate it because it actually looks, it looks forward, you know. Um, uh, and I, I think that um, you're right. You know, you're right to advocate for that. That it, it's, it's, um, it's something that we that we should try. We should be able to trust ourselves and 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 have. Uh, collaboration between companies and and and, and communities and, and and the and the government i mean i i, I really uh, like that um the idea of it as the reformation which was a process of democratization of the religious structure really where like a, a person no longer needs a, a priest to intercede between them and god it's it's like sure. instead divest that power more broadly in the people uh, absolutely and also uh the the translation of the of the of, of the Vulgate into hmm. uh, into German into into common into common uh, uh, vernacular mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, the, it, it invokes again like the, the the printing press right it's like now we have this new new method of communication new method of domination through culture and through propaganda through publication through all sorts of deeds and every, everything and it's it's now it's it's a brave new world that we're in. Mm. You know? Where, uh, but it's a variation on that theme. It's how, how uh, opening opening the field. I don't know. I, I know that, that I'm not making uh, perfect historical analogies. I know they're not possible to make anyway. But um, that's really interesting. Um, and I, I, pretty soon we're going to open it up in about uh, five minutes or so. But I did want to um, talk talk about on a final point of uh, something you wrote a perspective on a spiritual melding with technological development, um, which I think would, I mean, forgive me for this, for using these terms, but like it would, it would, it would be a natural, it would be a natural progression to, to the, if the more we, we integrate technology into our lives, the maybe over time we could, we can possibly attain greater balance and, uh, I wonder what have you been, that's maybe that's not something you've been, you said you hadn't been thinking about, but uh, did you have anything to say on that? That's the spiritual melding with, with technological development. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think this is definitely more your area of expertise than mine. Uh, Cause oh, I yeah. think as a uh, um, <laughs> kind of, uh, as, like, an what I've been talking about. <laughs> um, as, as an engineer, I fancy myself kind of a systems thinker. So I uh, kind of transitioned from thinking about systems architecture to thinking about political economy. Um, <clears throat> let's see. But um, at the widest kind of uh, looking at from the widest possible lens, like what I'm talking about is where does the responsibility for um, building and, and steering the, the, the vessel of technology lie? And what we've been doing for a really long time is just kind of like seeding that to, to text leaders. Uh, 
I don't think that we op- we chose that, but we've been living with it and not not sufficiently resisting it. Um, so you know, I I don't think that um, the even the best billionaire really has a lot in common with me. I feel like I have a lot more in common with like the the homeless community of San Francisco, even as a wealthy person, compared to a, a billionaire who commands like the labor of tens of thousands of people, right? That's, that's control over tens of thousands of people's lives and livelihoods that I have, I have none of. Um, but we've just been kind of comfortable handing that responsibility over. So the kind of more uh, like cultural or even spiritual shift is like taking up responsibility for, for the, the structures of, of technology. Um, so one way that looks is to say like, you know, I'm not going to work for an app that has 100 million users. Like, I don't think that's a good 100 million workers on it. Like, my boss should not be an app. I'm accountable to my my community, not some like metrics, uh, you know, that lead to Silicon Valley making a couple cents anytime somebody buys food in the world. Like that that just doesn't really like drive with my my impression of how I want my like species to live. Um, so one one area I've been looking at there is to, to empower. Uh, individual workers and, and like users of technology more at the leaves of the system uh, would be something I've been studying, um, this idea of platform cooperativism. Um, I'm not sure if this is super widespread in this community, but um, it's this idea that uh, we're, we're going to have labor platforms for the foreseeable future, the labor platform being like DoorDash or Postmates or Amazon Mechanical Turk, etc. Um, but what would it look like if those had a different structure? Um, suppose, you know, the very obvious example would be like, what if Uber, but the drivers owned it? Um, and there's a lot of difficulty in, in getting these, these, these things launched, of course, because kind of the mechanics of the Ubers of the world is to burn a couple billion dollars in, in capital uh, in order to win regional monopolies and then finally become profitable um, within, within regions where the monopolies have been successful. And like that is kind of a war of attrition that burns more capital than a cooperative structure will ever have access to. But um, there are still a few examples of um, uh, successful platform cooperatives or things that point to a future where platform cooperativism is, is an option for, for other scales of operation. Um, there's this stock photos app kind of um, like um, you, can, you can buy photographs off of for, for media uh, called Stocksy that is owned by its photographers. There's a few efforts to get like, you know, Bandcamp but owned by the, the uh, creators up and running. Um, this idea has been kicking around, excuse me, kicking around academia for a couple of years, but um, it, I think it's starting to gain a little bit of traction just as, as, a, as, a, as a thought. I would not say it's really taken off. Um, so I recently took a course at the New School in New York online um, that was co-taught between the kind of founder of the platform cooperative movement with um, teachers from the Mandra- Mondragon Corporation in Spain. Um, Mondragon is the world's largest worker cooperative. So it's a manufacturing and retail uh, corporation, but is owned by its workers and employs about 60,000 workers. So you might have been at to a cooperative here in San Francisco, like Ares Mindy or Rainbow Grocery. There's, there's a lot of like local co-ops like that. Uh, what distinguishes them is, you know, they're owned by the people who work there. Um, the people who are ultimately responsible for the success and decision making of the company are the same people who, you know, sweat and toil. Um, I think that's a better model. Um, you know, uh, nobody outsources their own job. Nobody dumps toxic waste in their own backyard. Uh, kind of centralizing decision making power more at the leaves will lead to better outcomes, in my opinion. It's just incompatible with the. Uh, continued increase in the rate of profit. Right. Well, some people do dump toxic waste in their own backyard, actually. Um, but yeah, I know what you mean. We shouldn't. We shouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I, I, I'm really looking forward to reading all of these different articles that uh, I've, that are kind of surrounding you and uh, Donna Haraway, for sure. I'm going to really dive into her. Um, and I just wanted to open it up now uh, to anybody here who has any questions uh, for Jason. Hello. Um, I'm super curious the degree to which you see the ability to kind of change the way that tech operates is coming within the tech is coming from within the technology community, whether that's activism or self-regulation versus 
uh, instruments from sort of either government, whether that's tort reform or civil liability reform or uh, more kind of regulatory action around things like antitrust? Uh, great question. Should I go ahead and take that? Yeah, go cool. ahead. Um, yeah, super good question. I think um, uh, it's going to require like an inside outside strategy. So change coming from within the community as well as pressure coming from outside. Um, the kind of, so regulation is tough. Um, my, let's see, one of my other kind of gripes about the TikTok Facebook situation is um, the way the way technology seems to work in the West is it's built by these multinational corporations that work at a supranational level. So they they can kind of arbitrage between different states to find to like play them off each other. It's like, OK, you know, hey, EU, you're going to apply these apply these privacy um, requirements like, you know, we're just not going to put an office there anymore. We're not going to prioritize economic growth in your region. Um, we're going to you know, that's that's actually what's going on there is capital is disciplining the state um, by threatening capital flight or withholding investment or favoring certain regulatory regimes. Um, so that's super scary to me. Like that's kind of, uh, th that's probably the, the I think, um, gosh, uh, Astor Taylor maybe calls up like the core, like the, the core frightening thing of our age, like the, the core terror of, of today is, uh, is that supranational capital uh, seems to be winning against nationalist uh, like democracy. Um, so I have a lot of skepticism about, about regulation and I'm not dedicating my life to that. Um, I still am super supportive of policy. Um, and I think, uh, the EU is kind of leading the way there. The, the core difference between say EU antitrust and American antitrust, uh, as y'all probably know is in the EU antitrust has this very broad, um, definition of like, does this corporation have too much power? And, you know, power can be defined in a lot of different ways. Uh, here in the U S antitrust only talks about consumer prices. Like is the consumer price or, or price of something being, uh, manipulated. Um, so like, you know, Facebook's free, uh, even if the price of ads or something is falling, like it's hard to say Facebook doesn't have too much power. Um, another place that's not going to come from is tech's, uh, is venture capitalists, like tech's owners, just, they, they have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. Um, I'm sure they're nice people. And, you know, if you hang out with them at a barbecue, they're, they're fun to talk to, but like at the end of the day, there's a structural control, like restraint, uh, placed on them and, uh, they can't, they can't like bite the hand that feeds them. Um, so, uh, I'm very passionate about arguing against, uh, our movement being led by uh by venture capitalists and even founders to a degree though founders are kind of like workers in some ways um so it's, it's going to come from anywhere it's going to come from workers um the, we don't know how to do that yet but that's that's the only place i have hope cool thanks interesting answer hi um i wanted to first of all i want to say um uh, it's super interesting and i'm i've also looked pretty deeply into a number of these issues especially at one point sort of worker cooperatives and how that operates. And there's a number of other mechanisms that one can use to align companies to employees or align companies to values um, that, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm curious if you've looked into including like steward ownership, um, uh, there are aspects of benefit corporations that are extensible. Um, and then like you talked about fiduciary duty, there's this um, thing called universal owner theory, which um, I might actually have someone come in to speak to SBC about in a, um, because it's really about what investors can do. Um, but the idea is that if everyone has a diverse enough set of assets, um, which, is which is what's true of the largest investors um, right now in, in the world, um, then it's actually better for them not to have people do extractive um, actions like, you know, whether it's oil um, uh, and, you know, toxic waste or it's Facebook and toxic information pollution. But what I wanted to ask you about um, was, I, I guess there was, like as someone who's been part of this space and really been really pushing organizations like Facebook to do a variety of things over the last four years, um, I was a little confused about the idea that, I, I guess like I'm trying to understand how you can make ranking, um, like the details of ranking public in an environment where manipulation and fraud are one of the main components that, um, that you're trying to address. And so like, I, I was curious if you have a nuanced view about how to, how to sort of square that circle. And even when you think about things like GPT-3, like I come from the world where when you look at the ways the actual threat actor is involved, and I'm actually doing some work directly on this right now for some organizations, like there's a lot of, there's real danger to having like power 
um, centralized, but there's also pay danger of having power um, proliferated. And so there's a balancing act that seems to be necessary in that case, if, if you thought through that. So um, there's a lot there. So there's, there's the two, two core things there are like ranking and uh, uh, research um, and sort of the, like the way power um, uh, is distributed in both of those cases. Um, yeah, those are, those are some good thoughts. Um, let's see. So on this concept of universal ownership, I have only just Googled it now, but I, I think it kind of clicks. Um, really but, useful. Um, yeah, that, that is cool. Like this idea that, uh, well, if, you know, every, if, if institutions own every, a little bit of everything, then they guide, you know, uh, towards collective benefit. Uh, I would, I would guess it's still hard for them. Well, two, two complaints or two, uh, um, uh, criticism coming from maybe a Marxist angle is, you know, the first, like, can they ever actually uh, challenge growth itself? Like, what if economic growth is not a goal? What if degrowth is a goal, which uh, some environmentalists would advocate for today? Um, you can't use this growth uh, maximization engine towards degrowth. Um, or I'd be expecting a lot of it to realize that degrowth is the best way to growth, you know, or dematerial, like degrowth to de dematerialization to growth. Um, and the second is like the tendency of, is capital to centralize and conglomerate. Um, and that's, uh, you know, maybe a, a benevolent, a benevolent dictator of capital is still a benevolent dictator. And like, where maybe we should aim higher towards towards something more democratic. But it's a super interesting thought experiment and better than than most thoughts on growth that I read about. Like the the kind of growth or orthodoxy cult is is a big problem in tech, I would say. Yeah. Um, there's, there's many veins you could go down here, but I know. We can... uh, yeah, definitely. I'd love a, an email about it. Um, so then, uh, okay. So is, you know, if we open source the algorithms, will nefarious actors be more empowered? Um, I'm not a security engineer, but I know like, you know, security through obscurity is no security at all. Um, so there's probably an argument that uh, transparency and introspection among uh, researchers would probably lead to better outcomes. And if we're going to be stuck in this uh, arms race, then like, I don't know, maybe more visibility would, would still help or at least access to like a wider set of researchers. Um, though I know like Facebook has been opening some, some access there. Yeah, um, that that a hundred percent. There's a, there's an incredible amounts of access that needs to be provided. Uh -huh. um, and I've actually been a part of some um, work around that. But but yeah, like the security obscurity thing breaks down when you're talking about fraud, unfortunately. Um, uh, like it just like those that at least the, 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 like historically, as in like in every every area of fraud, like mm. that argument you can't obscurity that is actually somewhat necessary for defeating for, for addressing fraud. At least it has been historically. Um, and so you'd have to have some reason why it isn't true. Um, but I want to let other people speak if there are questions, so I won't keep talking. I'm sorry. Can I just ask, just to respond to, to what you just said, I'm super curious what your stance on encryption is, because I mean, historically, there's been a very long discussion around open source encryption algorithms, and specifically one of the reasons being that it's such an adversarial space that actually having them being open source and having the contributions available from everyone is a positive thing. And to me, it seems somewhat analogous that these kinds of ranking algorithms could operate in a similar way because they're similarly like adversarial spaces as well. Yeah, Aviv, is that a different situation? It's completely different, yeah. <laughs> like encryption is like a mathematical operation where you like have guarantees. Um, and you want that to be as public as possible because there's a set of guarantees that you're trying to ensure are actually satisfied. In a fraud environment, it's a, um, it's like, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a people trying to be as much like you as possible. Um, and so like, if you're trying to like say, is this clone actually the real, the real you? Like you, there's no, um, there, like, th there's no thing, no guarantee that you're trying to make. And so when you tell them, oh, I can tell because your skin is shiny. So you're actually the robot. Well, then, then, any, then all the robots will make their skin not shiny. And so now you've, you, you've, you've lost your ability to actually detect the robots. And this is literally the, the issue that we see with GAMS, with GPT-3, and also with search with ranking, um, with like, you know, it's why Google search results, like wh why no version, like why there isn't a search engine that I'm aware of that actually has like, and, and has like fully opened the ways in which they defeat fraud because all of that is really, really locked down, um, unfortunately. I wish we lived in a world where we didn't have those dynamics, but it's actually like a systems, uh, like a, a systems property um, for particular types of problems. So if you're thinking about like the Danella Meadows, type things like there's a um, there's a name for this particular systems interaction 
that is like super annoying. Um, well, um, let's see. So we can do better with access to researchers. We can open more and more of it over time. Yeah. Um, but then there's actually an extreme where like the, the kinds of technologies that we should develop should potentially be bounded by what we can do safely. Um, so there, right now there's an active abolition movement in the United States against uh, facial recognition in the, in the use of like, in use by law enforcement. Um, so Ben Tarnoff, who's the editor of Logic Magazine, makes this argument pretty well. Um, he's amazing. If you could have him here instead of me, that would be better, but uh, I'm here. So uh, he's actually a pretty outspoken advocate for the idea of abolition of certain technologies, and he's a technologist as well. Um, there, there should at least be a, a conversation about um, what kind of technologies and what are their effects that should we be investing in. Um, and that is something that's not really compatible with the growth model. Uh, you know, if, if a technology could lead to growth along some metric or uh, returns on capital, then under a market economy, we just do that um, with very, very uh, little like kind of restraint on it. So potentially like, you know, we don't uh, develop, I guess we do develop more and more kinds of nuclear weapons, but like, you know, there's been a, an abolition campaign against that for, you know, over half a century now and potentially, uh, I don't know, AI abolition isn't a completely outlandish idea to me. But then, you know, today everyone's making the nationalist argument like Zuck is about to go to court and say like, you know, what's good for Facebook is good for the United States of America. And uh, you get into this kind of like super national global capital utilizing nationalism against other national for nationalist forces kind of situation. And again, it's a whoever wins, we lose situation. Well, that was a really interesting conversation all around. Um, I, I, sh I have to go guys um, at one, but I, I, um, I'm, I, I'm just grateful for all of that too. I mean, I, I need to learn more is what, I, what I'm realizing. I need to educate myself. Thank you so uh, much, uh, Aiden Chang for providing this. Thank you all, this has been really fun. Thank you. Everyone. Cheers. Oh, can I plug my uh, my newsletter? If you uh, want to read more stuff by me, I'll type in the chat. It's uh, venturecommune.substack.com. Venture capital is over. We're doing venture commune now. I will be writing to you later this week, probably. Very cool. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. I assume there's some way to reach you listed there, probably? Uh, yeah, you can reply to him or uh, Jason Prado at Gmail. Yep. Okay, just doing it. Yeah, that works. All right, great. Thanks so much, y'all. Oh, Jason. Yep. Thanks, man. For sure. Yeah, it was really nice talking to you. I um, I'm sorry, I sort of swerved all around the place <laughs> when we were talking. Uh, your your uh, what you think is so beyond me. It's uh, I, I really I really appreciate. I'm gonna read more of of Haraway for sure. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, it's, it's really dense. So what I did with that text is it, it's short enough that like a friend and I just sat there and read one sentence back and forth to each other until we could understand it. Cause, and it took like three days, but I highly recommend it. Well, that's probably, it would probably take me six days, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, thanks man. Um, and I'll, I'm going to continue to correspond with you. I have some, some up more questions for you for sure. Awesome. Uh, well, thanks again. Yeah. Thanks. And keep uh -huh. safe. Stay safe. Well, thanks for moderating this. Sorry, that was weird. I don't know if that was a if if if, it, if, it, if I was good in the end. I I didn't feel as prepared for talking to him. So that's no, that's totally okay. I think um, I was trying to grasp what you're talking about throughout the conversation to you because I'm not like a software engineer, and what you're talking about is very dense actually, and. <laughs> this yeah, I'm, I'm just like I'm like why did why was I asked to but it's okay it was cool because uh, he seems kind so it's all good yeah I'm yeah. glad there are other people who are like very into this tech activism realm and so like yeah. they actually have sparked some really interesting conversation yeah well I, I hope um, I hope some people will listen to it it's all good I yeah I have to read more about that Haraway though she that blew my mind that that uh, cyborg essay Okay. Okay. Cypher. Okay. Interesting. I have not. Me neither. That. Yeah. So. Uh, how's your script going, by the way? My what? Oh, weren't you? Are you? Weren't you writing something last time that we? Yeah. Um. 
so I was taking, I'm actually still taking this online writing class called Write Out Passage. Uh -huh. um, yeah, well, I'm, I haven't started a script, <laughs> to be honest. No, no. no. Um, but I've been trying to think about uh, like the scene, like separate scene instead of like the storyline. So mm -hmm. I don't know. That's good. Sometimes you just have to write it one scene at a time, you know? One yeah, scene. yeah, but exactly. All right. I, I, uh, I'm grateful again and thanks. Yeah, of course. Um, who is this Serena? I don't know. Oh, is it Ser Serena from... Um... I don't know. I don't know. Weird. Okay, whatever. <laughs> okay, I'll see you then. Thank you. Bye.